right, good morning. Good to see you all this morning, and uh, I'm glad that you're here. I know we have several families out this morning, but we're glad that you're here and uh, looking forward to what God has for us today. I always love getting in the Bible, amen? And uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6. And uh, you don't have to turn there now, but we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 12. And we're going to be looking at this thought, being strong in the Lord or standing strong in the Lord. And uh, I tell you, in today's world, we need some men and women and boys and girls who will stand strong in the Word of God, in the Lord. And so uh, we're going to be looking at that, challenging with, with you with that this morning. And I look forward to it. Uh, however, before that, we're going to sing to the Lord. And uh, the Bible says that, that we're to bring all of our praise, all of our worship, all of our uh, song, everything that we can do that we, that we should do it as unto the Lord. So this morning, uh, we want to sing to the Lord uh, because there's so much uh, that, we, that, that, that he's done for us. If you're saved this morning and everything else in your life crumbles down, you have something to sing about. And uh, if you're not saved this morning, you can get saved. You can get born again, the Bible calls it, and you can start a new life in Christ and it'll give you something to sing about. And uh, so uh, I, I, I trust that one way or another, either I hope that you're singing with us at the beginning or you're singing with us at the end, but that you can sing to the Lord. Let's stand together and uh, we're going to sing the solid rock. Praise the 
a voice as Christians. Let's raise it to God and praise him. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our voice to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our voice to heaven and praise the a few minutes and say good morning to somebody you haven't spoken to yet and let's fellowship for a few minutes and then we'll come back together and sing some more.
back together and sing Wonderful, Merciful Savior.
You may be seated this morning. Thank you so much. And I love that song, Behold Our God. Amen. Makes it easy to get up and preach after you sing a song like that. And, uh, but before we get into the message, I do want to let our church know that, um, and some of you may already know this, but uh, Miss Noemi in the back, she lost her mother this week. And uh, if you would, I'd be praying uh, for her and be praying uh, for Noah and the family. Uh, I know that that was, um, it's, it's, it's hard, but as we were talking this week, uh, she says, uh, I'm comforted in knowing that my mom's with the Lord. And uh, so uh, we rejoice with our uh, sister in Christ. Uh, we rejoice that her mom is in the presence of Jesus. She has a wonderful testimony. Um, Noah put out a post this week talking about uh, his grandma being one of the first people to talk to him about the Lord. And so, uh, so we, we, we rejoice in that she's with the Lord. We, we sorrow for those that will miss her here. Hermana, lo siento mucho, pero gracias a Dios que la veremos un día. Adelante, amen. Uh, let's, uh, if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Ephesians uh, chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. In our Bibles, Ephesians chapter number 6. Our goal today is not to put on a show. Our goal today is to proclaim the Word of God and hope that it will change your heart and life in some way. And uh, we've been going through the book of Ephesians and uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And we made it here to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2. 10. I want to read these three verses together, and we're going to come back and, and kind of break it apart a little bit. If you would, there in your Bibles, follow along with me in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to uh, stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is the reality, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we face every day. This is the enemy that the Bible portrays. As believers, we need to be reminded that the people of God face, face some very real and some very powerful enemies in this world. Uh, it, we're naive if we get up every morning and believe that the Christian life is hunky-dory and that we're not going to uh, face or fight the enemy. Uh, the Bible's very plain, it's very clear. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God because there's some things that you're going to face. You're going to face the wiles of the devil. And, uh, and, so, and so we see this in our lives. There is an enemy his name is Satan, and he has demons, and they're doing all they can to undermine the work of God in this world. Uh, Satan and his uh, demons are doing everything that they can to rob God of his glory. They're doing all they can to defeat and discourage the people of God. They're doing all they can to hinder the church, the body of Christ. They're doing all they can to see that we, the people of God, fail in our mission to live for God and to bring him glory the enemies we face are powerful the battles we fight are real the costs of defeat are higher than we realize the glories of victory are far more wonderful than we can imagine and this passage tells us to be strong in the Lord in these spiritual battles of life that are raging around us if we are challenged to be strong then we must first look at where our strength comes from if God says hey I want you to be strong we must look very carefully to see where our strength comes from look with me uh, at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 again it says finally my brethren be strong and then it says and if you have a pencil I want you to underline this in the Lord in the Lord and in the power of his might our strength this morning point number one that I want to if you're taking notes you can write this down as we think about this thought of being strong 
and, and where our, and, and, and where our uh, strength comes from, the first thing that we see here is the source of our strength. The source of our strength. Our strength comes from a person. It says to be strong in the Lord. The word strong means to be empowered or to be strengthened. Our power comes from His might. You and I are weak creatures. We really are. We are weak emotionally. We are weak in, in the way that we think. We are weak in our spirits. We are weak when it comes to temptation and sin. That's why the Bible says that this temptation doth so easily beset us. Why? Because we are weak. We are weak in our ability to control our own wills. We are simply weak and we need someone to help us. Amen. Amen. The strength we need to walk in victory in the battles of life will never come from within ourselves. You need to understand that. You will never find within yourself the strength to fight Satan and his enemies in the flesh. You'll never find, you'll never find strength there. It never comes from within. The strength we need can only come from the Lord. This verse says to be strong in the Lord. That means that any spiritual strength that we can ever hope to possess must come from Him. Spiritual power can only be ours through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, people might come to you and they may say, how in the world do you have that kind of strength? How in the world do you face death the way that you face death? How do you face this disease or sickness that you're struggling with the way that you face that? And the answer that should come from any believer ought to be, I can only face that because of the Lord. I can only go through this circumstance. I can only go through this trial. I can only walk through this path because of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing from within. It's, it all comes from him and oftentimes uh, the, the worst funerals that you can ever attend are funerals of lost people because they have no hope uh, they have no hope and, and and they come to that funeral uh, oftentimes uh, w without that hope and and without that strength and without that uh, the assurance uh, of, of, of what's coming after this life and, and and so they come and they're broken and and, and and there's no hope why because they're not resting in the strength of the Lord uh, but a believer can go to a funeral, and, and though they can be sad, uh, and though they can be discouraged, and, and, low, and, and though they, they're going to miss their loved one, they can have that blessed hope. Uh, they can have that strength, and they can have uh, that, 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 that strength that comes from God. They can have that peace that passeth all understanding, because they're walking in the strength of the Lord. Spiritual power can only be ours through a relationship with Jesus Christ. A lost person doesn't understand anything about this power. We need his power if we're going to stand against the attacks that we face in this life. Just as we need his blood to take away our sins, we need his power to defeat Satan. I want you to look at this next phrase with me in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might how do we get this power we get it the same way that we have our sins forgiven we get it the same way we are given his righteousness we get it the same way that we are saved we get it simply by trusting him and not trusting in ourselves you know that i don't know you probably know this but i want to remind you this morning if if we try to stand against satan and his forces in our own strength, our own power, will fail. Many of a mighty have fallen. Why? Because they went from resting in the Lord to resting in their own power. If I can learn to lean on the Lord, if I can confess my own weaknesses and place my faith in his power alone... I have the ability to have victory in my life. One of the truths that Paul has been trying to teach us that when we are saved, we are made one with Jesus. And I thank the Lord for that. Uh, and so if that's true, his truth becomes my truth. His way becomes my way. His power becomes what? My power. His strength becomes my strength. And so uh, when you are in Jesus by faith, uh, saved by his grace, you become a partaker of his power. 
You become a partaker of his strength. You become a partaker of his ability. And if there is to be any spiritual power or any spiritual victory, it must come from him. It must be given to us by the Lord. This verse reminds us that we are foolish when we trust in ourselves. We're foolish when we trust in our own power. We are foolish when we think that we can fight the devil and his demons. When we think that we can fight sin and we can fight temptation and we can fight the world and we can fight the other enemies of life in our own strength. When we think that we can do that in our own strength, we become foolish. We must realize we can't handle it. We must realize that we are weak. We must realize that if we try to do it on our own, we will be defeated. We must not trust in ourselves, but trust in Jesus Christ, who has promised his power and promised his victory to his people. Uh, whenever you face uh, temptation in your life, uh, oftentimes we think, well, I can conquer this temptation by sheer will power. No, you can't. You might for a short period of time, but not for the long term. We must realize that we are weak. I love the promises, though, that we find in the Bible on this subject. If, you don't have to turn there, but if you were to turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. My strength comes from the Lord. Amen. Can I get an amen this morning? Are we here? All right. Just want to make sure we're together. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. It, it's, 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 it, our thanks ought to be to Him because He's the one that causes us to be able to triumph in Him. In, in Romans 8, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through who? Through Jesus, through Him that loved us, according to Romans. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He never once says, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the strength to handle it in our flesh. He never says, Thanks be to God for, for the strength to overcome by sheer willpower. He always says that our victory, that our strength comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look at this, the source of our strength, the source of our strength is the Lord. But I want you to see this. The source of our stability. The source of our stability. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 6. It says this in verse 11. But put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This verse here teaches us the glorious truth that it is possible for us to stand. You don't have to get up defeated every morning like, well, I'm just not going to be able to stand. It's, it's hopeless. I can't do it. No, the Bible says that, 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 that we are to put on the whole armor of God that we can stand. God desires for you to stand. God desires for you to be strong. And this verse teaches us that it's possible that we can stand against the enemies that we face in this life. All of those who are in Christ are commanded to put on the whole armor of God. And God knew that in this life you're going to face an enemy. And, and, and if you're going to face this enemy and be able to stand strong, that he would need to equip you. He would have to equip me to face these battles. And he did so by giving us an armor. He said, well, I'm not, just going to, uh, I'm not just going to give you the power that you need and the strength that you need, but I'm also going to give you the stability that you need. I'm going to give you uh, this, this armor. And this armor is listed, if you go through uh, verses 14 through 17, it lists each piece by, uh, by name. And we're going to study those in the weeks uh, to follow. But uh, each piece of the armor of God is designed to protect the people of God against attacks from the enemy.
In this message, I want you to consider, though, the words armor. If you go back and look at our passage this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, put on the whole armor. These words, I want you to think about these words with me. The word armor refers to the equipment that God has provided for us to wear in the days of battle. The truth is that we are given a belt and there is truth to wear and it's, and, and it's as a belt. There's righteousness to protect the heart. There's shoes to protect the feet. There's a shield to deflect the arrows of the enemy. There's a helmet to protect the head. There's a sword to use to engage the enemy. All of this has been provided to every believer so that we might walk in victory. That word whole there suggests that every piece of the armor of God is essential. Sometimes we get up and we think, well, you know what, I'll put on, I'll put on the breastplate, but I don't much feel like wearing the helmet, right? It's all essential. Every piece is essential. You can't leave the head exposed. You can't leave the heart exposed. Your heart's deceitfully wicked. You can't leave it exposed. You can't leave anything exposed. It is essential that we put on the whole armor if we're going to endure and have a victory over the enemy. By the way, you can't put on a few pieces and leave off a few pieces and achieve success. You must wear every piece. And here's the key all the time. You don't pick it up and put it on and take it off. The phrase put on carries the idea that when we put on the armor of God, we leave it there all the time. We never take a break. We never take it off. You are in a battle 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're in a battle. You cannot afford to take off the armor. You cannot afford for one day to put down your Bible and say this isn't important today. You can't for one day put off prayer and say, I'll get back to that tomorrow. Uh, it's not important today. Uh, the, uh, your relationship with God is critical every day. We're to put on that armor. We're to never take it off. You're to never set down your sword. You're to never set down your shield. You're to never uh, take off the breastplate or the helmet. God has equipped us for the battles that we face. He's given us everything that we need to stand against the enemy and to enjoy his victory day by day. But it's up to us to wear the armor that we've been given. But there's number three, this third thought I want to give you, and that's this. This is where I'm going to spend some time at this morning. I want you to see this, the source of our struggles. The source of our struggles. Why do we need to put on this armor? The Bible says at the end of verse 11. So that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. We're told that our enemy is the devil. The devil is the enemy of God. And if you are in Christ... The moment that you become in Christ, Satan becomes your enemy also. All right? He stands against everything that God stands for. If God says that marriage is between a man and a woman, Satan says, no, it's not. It's between two men or two women. Satan always opposes God. If God says, if God says uh, uh, that, that, that we shouldn't murder, uh, Satan says we should be allowed to kill babies. You have the right to choose to, to murder. If God, says, if God says one thing, Satan always comes right back around and says something else. Satan, my friend, I want you to understand this. Satan is the enemy of God. It's not funny. He's not the cartoon character with the pitchfork. It's not something to laugh at. Our enemy is a real enemy. He stands against everything God stands for. And understand this, he hates God and wants nothing more than to be God himself and Lord over all. According to the Bible, the devil is the source of evil. 
He is the source of all our struggles in life. Sin was first exposed in the heart of, uh, of the creature known as Lucifer. And he determined that he would be God. And that he would exalt himself above the throne of the one true God. And, uh, but we know the story. Satan was defeated. He was cast out of heaven along with a third of the angels who followed him. And those fallen angels are now demons. And Satan still does all he can to dethrone God and to rob God of his glory. That is our enemy. He's powerful. He's deceptive. He's experienced. He's been attacking. He's been deceiving. He's been defeating the people of God since the day that he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. He has now had over 6,000 years of experience and practice. And he knows what he's doing. I'm not giving the devil any glory this morning. I'm simply telling you the truth about our enemy. He's nothing to play with. Paul says that God will give us power to cause us to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles speaks of scheming tricks. The word wiles speaks of a wild animal that silently and cunningly stalks its prey and then unexpectedly pounces on it and devours it. And my friend, that is what Satan does. He is a deceitful liar and will do everything he can to fool you. He will do everything he can to, to toy with your heart and to toy with your emotions and to make you think that what you're doing is even good and, and biblical, but he's always twisting the word of God. He's always twisting it. And he's waiting to pounce on you. He's waiting to devour you. Satan has always been and always will be a scheming trickster. Never trust him. Remember that he has a plan to trick you. Satan wants to destroy everything that is good in your life, especially if you're saved. If you are saved and you're born again and you're a Bible believer and you're, you, 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 you're, you're a Christ follower and, and you've, the, you've forsaken the world and you've turned to Christ, you've turned from your sin and you've turned to Christ, Satan wants nothing more than to destroy you. He wants to destroy your testimony. If he can destroy your testimony, then guess what? Other people won't want to follow this Christ. And that's, and, and that's a sad thing. Uh, every day you turn on the news, every day you get on the internet, every day you get on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and you see some man of God somewhere, some woman of God, or, or whatever the case may be, you, you see that, that somebody fell into some grave sin and, 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 and are out of the ministry now, and it gets blown up, and everybody says, well, if that's what Christianity is, we don't want Christianity. And, 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 and that's what Satan loves. He loves to get in, and he loves to cause a believer to fall into sin and, and get that believer to thinking that he's more powerful than that sin. And at the right moment, he comes in, and he devours, and it ruins testimonies. He wants to destroy our churches. He wants to destroy our families. By the way, he doesn't destroy our churches by shutting them down. Let me talk to you about that for just a second. He wants to destroy our churches by getting us to not even focus on preaching the word of God anymore we have churches all over America that don't even know what this is we have churches all over America that they're getting up and they're preaching some other gospel it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and, and so he's okay with a with a church building he's okay with a sign that says church but he doesn't like it when you come in and you sing praises to the Lord he doesn't like it when you open up the word of God and you say thus saith the Lord he doesn't like it he wants to destroy those churches. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to destroy our marriages. He wants to destroy our children. He wants to destroy our nation. A nation that once uh, was formed because they loved God. A nation that was once formed because they said, we want to we wanna be able to have the freedom to worship the one true and living God. He wants to destroy that nation, and he's doing so. But I want to say something this morning. As much as Satan wants to do all of that, as much as Satan seems to be winning, I want you to understand this. God is able. 
through His power to enable us to take our stand against the attacks of state of Satan. Even though other places, other churches or other Christians may look like uh, they're falling, even though the world around us may look like it's crumbling, you and I, my friend, we can stand strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. When Satan attacks, we are made to be able to stand. We do not have to give ground. We do not have to be defeated. We don't have to lose the battles of life. This matter of standing is illustrated by the Lord Jesus when he was tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4. In that passage, Satan was on the offensive and Jesus merely stood there when the word of God uh, on the word of God and refused to yield. Every time Satan came to him and tempted him, what did, say, what did Jesus do? Jesus simply went back to the word of God and, and quoted scripture to, to Satan. He stood, Jesus is our ultimate example. And what did Jesus do? He stood in the power of the word. That's what Jesus did. And he will enable us to do the same thing. He goes on in verse 12. And he reaffirms who our enemy is. Look with me there, Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That, that word wrestle is a word used to describe hand-to-hand -hand combat. It speaks of the struggles that took place in the Roma, Roman arenas. When the people that would come to, to fight each other uh, met on the field of battle and they were fighting for their lives. The first one to, to, the, the first one to die loses. <laughs> That's how it went. It was a fight to the death. And I want to say this as kindly as I know how to say this this morning. You and I, we are in a literal fight for our lives. We're in a fight for our families. We're in a fight for our marriages. We're in a fight for our country. We're in a fight for all of the things that God stands for. We are in a fight this morning. The fight of our lives. Our enemy will stop at nothing to destroy us. He will use any trick, any deception, any tactic that he can think of to bring defeat. You say, preacher, what do we do? I submit to you, we need God's power. We need God's help. We need him if we hope to stand against the relentless attacks of the enemy. I want you to notice what this verse teaches us about our enemy real quick and his identity. The Bible here is very clear in verse 12 about who our enemy is. But it even confirms who our enemy is not. Our enemy, it says, is not what? Flesh and blood. He, what he's saying here is, is our enemy is never another human being. Now think about that with me for a second. Where do we take, as, as believers oftentimes, where do we take out our anger? On other humans. When was the last time you got, heard somebody get up and just give a hissy fit about the devil? You haven't. What do we do? Well, we got to blame the president. Well, we got to blame the Congress. Well, we got to blame this per Nancy Pelosi, she's a good one to blame. Praise <laughs> God. Amen. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that this morning. Right? We have to put our blame on a person. Uh, we, we have to put our blame on agendas. The homosexual community, they're, they're the enemy. The abortion community, they're the enemy. The Bible says that our enemy is not flesh and blood. But there's a different enemy. There's principalities. There's powers. And there's rulers of the darkness of this world. Let's not forget, friend, who the enemy is. Our enemy is never another human. People hurt us. People lie to us. Other Christians hurt us. 
people are mean to us. People do us wrong. But guess what? They're not your enemy. They may be doing the work of the enemy, but they are not the enemy. They may want to see our destruction, but they are not the enemy. They may hate you, but they're not the enemy. See, one of the greatest tricks of the devil is to focus our attention on other people and how they treat us. Satan says, Satan, Satan starts, remember, he's a trickster. So he sits over there and he starts stirring the pot. Remember what so-and-so said to you? Remember what so-and-so did to you? Remember what this, you remember this over here? You remember that over there? And so, so Satan starts stirring the pot and he wants to get you uh, to, to, to focus uh, not on him, not on his demons. He wants you to focus on people. He wants you to focus on flesh and blood. And that's why Ephesians says, hey, our enemy's not flesh and blood. Our enemy's always been Satan. But he uses people to distract us and get us to keep us from walking with the Lord. And when we take that bait and our focus and our attention on, on what people are doing to us, we lose sight of Jesus Christ and we lose sight of the will of God. And it has destroyed many a believers. When that happens, the enemy wins the battle and we're defeated. You know, we fight one another. When we fight one another, we always lose. Who wins that? Well, I won because I had the better point. No, both people lost. You know who wins when we fight one another in flesh and blood? You know who wins? Satan. Satan wins. The enemy is Satan. But he doesn't want to be, he, he doesn't want you, he doesn't want you going after him with the word of God. So what he would rather do is he'd rather get you upset with somebody else. <laughs> if I can get you distracted and upset with somebody else, I'm free to go do whatever I want to do and destroy more people. Don't fall for the prey. Don't fall to the enemy. Don't fall prey to the enemy. There is a real devil. Matter of fact, that's something, that, that's something that Satan will try to convince you. Oh, there's not really a real devil. Maybe not even really a heaven. We're always going to live and then one day reincarnate into some hogwash. There's a real devil. He hates God. He's doing everything he can to steal God's glory and undermine God's kingdom. He commands a vast army of demonic spirits. They're actively seeking to destroy, defeat, demolish, dismantle the kingdom of God. Satan does have power. However, he does not have all power. Amen? We underestimate his power, but he does not have all power. He is out to destroy everything that God is doing in the world, and one of the ways he does this is by deceiving the children of God. Let me give you a few ways that Satan deceives us, and then we're done. He deceives us by lying to us about the consequences of our sins. That's what he did to Eve in the garden, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You know what? It's okay if you want to go over here and, 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 and do something that the Bible says don't do. It's okay if you want to mess around, if you want to toy with it, if you want to play with it. Uh, if you want to, you know what? Uh, I, I can mess with somebody that's not my wife and, and I can control it and we can keep it from going too far. No, you can't. It's going to catch you one day. Satan's laying the bait. Oh, I can handle it. I can, I'm okay with it. My friend... You don't understand the consequences. He deceives you about the consequences of your sins. Everybody looks at David and, 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 I, and they say, well, he was a great man of God even though he was very sinful. But you know what God never did to David? He never let him out of the consequences of his sins. And so you can kind of look at David and you can see, say, well, David did a lot of things. You know, David did a lot of things that were worldly and God still looked at him as a man of God so I can do the same thing. Are you ready for the same consequences? If, if David could come with us and be here in flesh and blood this morning, I think David would plead with you. Don't fall prey to the devil. <laughs> it's not worth it. Uh, it may be fun for a season, but it's going to bite you, and the consequences are going to be great, and, and, and it'll almost be too much to bear. Go read the Psalms where I had to pour my heart back out to God. 
That's what Daly would tell you if he was here this morning. He deceives us by casting doubt on the word of God. He'll tell you that the truth is uh, a lie. And he will also tell you that lies are truth. And, 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 and it's never been so evident in our society as it is today. Everything that's evil is praised as good. And everything that's good is proclaimed as evil. That's from Satan. That's how he deceives us. He deceives us by causing us to doubt God's goodness. He will tell us that there is a better way than serving the Lord. Look at what happens to God's people. Look at the suffering that you have to endure. Uh, there's a better way. If you're living for this life, there may be a better way. But if you're living for the next life, there's no better way. He, deser he, de he deceives us by causing us to think that we will, that we will achieve salvation or victory on our own merits. My friend, there is nothing that you can do on your own merit to deserve salvation. The Bible is very clear. It is the grace of God. It's the grace of God. We were sitting out here yesterday. The youth did a yard sale fundraiser. Some of you all may have been sitting there, but we had a guy come up and started talking. And, and um, I asked him a question. We talked about guns for a while, which I know nothing about. So I had to act like I did, you know. Oh, yeah, you know that thing that you shoot and you, like, something does something automatically, you know. But anyways, we were talking about guns, and it flipped, and I asked him about if he, if he went to church anywhere and asked him if he was, had a relationship with God. And, and he says, I'm the last person that God would ever want. And I said, I said, why would you say a thing like that? He says, he says, I can't even tell you the bad, all the bad things I've done in this life. He says, he says, it'd be hypocritical for me to come to God now and beg for mercy and forgiveness after I've done all the things that I've done. He says, I can't even talk about them. They're so bad. So I started to share the gospel with him and I told him about God coming and paying for the sins of the world. And, and we were talking about that and and he said, I just can't get out of my mind how God, there could be a God that would do something like that. He said, I just have to believe in my own heart and mind that I would have to somehow pay for these sins and, and do enough good to overcome these bad. What happened? Satan deceived a man into thinking that salvation comes from our own merit. If you're here this morning, maybe you've never been saved. Can I beg you this morning to understand you can never come to the Lord because you're a good person you can only come to the Lord because he's good you can only come to the Lord because he's truth and he'll give you the grace and he'll give you the faith to believe in what he did for you our enemy is deceptive he's smart he's powerful he's after you he will destroy you and if he gets an opportunity. Here's how the Bible describes him. Turn with me. We'll, we'll, we'll end in this verse in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. If our instrumentalists, instrumentalists will get ready this morning, I'm going to read this verse and we'll be done. The Bible says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Can I tell you this morning, church, we need to be vigilant. I've got an enemy that wants to attack my family back there. I've got an enemy that wants to attack me. I've got an enemy that wants to attack this church. I've got an en enemy that would love to see our nation continue down the road it's going. But it's going to take some people that will say, you know what? I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand not in my own strength. I'm going to stand in the power of the Lord. I'm going to stand in his might. You may not even know what all that looks like yet. But I can tell you this. The first thing is recognizing that you're weak and that you need him. You may be here this morning and you're not saved. 
Maybe you need to come to Christ this morning. How do we defeat an enemy like that? Here's how. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It's the only way it can be done. You're no match for the devil. You're no match for his demons. But Jesus is. When we stand in him, he will equip us to be strong in the Lord. We're going to have a time of invitation this morning. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. We're not going to sing. We're just going to have a time of reflection. And I ask you to talk to the Lord right there where you're at. God, would you help me to be strong in you? Would you help me to be able to stand? Would you help me to put on this armor? And in the weeks ahead, as we look at what this armor represents, would you help me to put on that armor and to leave it on and to be vigilant because I have an adversary, the devil, who's roaming about seeking whom he may devour. Church, we need some people that will stand. I ask you to go to the Lord right now, wherever you're at. Maybe you're here this morning. And you've never been saved. And you say, preacher, I don't know what it means to be saved. If you'll get out of your seat and meet me down here in the front, I'll be glad to take God's word. And I'll sit here and show you right now what it means to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. How to be born again. If you're a believer, could I ask you to spend a few moments there in the quietness of your pew? Could I ask you just to go to the Lord in prayer? And in faith, ask God to help you to stand. As our instrumentalists play, you sit there and do business with God. Ask Him to work in your heart and life this morning. ask our worship team to come and uh, I think let's sing that song can you pull that up Emily back there yet not I you have a few few seconds to do it and uh, let's sing that song for the offering today how about that and um, if our men would make their way to the front we'll uh, receive our morning tithes and offerings thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord and giving if you're visiting with us, we don't ask you to give a dime. We're just glad that you came and worshiped with us today. Appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord. We have a couple visiting with us from Pennsylvania. Glad that they joined us today. It's a joy to have them. And, and I'm glad that people still go to church even when they're not at home. Amen.
And uh, so uh, let's have a word of prayer. And uh, let's ask the Lord to bless this offering. And uh, Brother Noah, would you say a blessing on the offering this morning?
All right. Again, thank you uh, for being here today. Just two quick, three quick announcements. Uh, the sending team would like uh, to thank all the ladies for participating uh, in the gift for Amanda last week. Uh, it was a it was a blessing to her and a bl and blessing for you all to participate and be a part of that. We want to say thank you for that. It was a blessing to have them with us last week. Amen. And um, uh, we're getting ready to do our next care package of gift cards, and we're doing it for the A family. Uh, and so if you would like uh, to, um, if you'd like to help, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby back on our board back there. Um, basically, it has the gift the, the type of gift card, whether it's uh, Amazon or Walmart or whatever, and you can sign up to bring that specific one. Um, and we'll be collecting that until the first week of July. So you have several weeks uh, to get those together. Um, and then if you would like more information about the A family uh, and you missed last week's service, we invite you to seek out a sending team member. And uh, there's a binder. If you go across the, the hall there, there's a binder that, that has um, all the information that we have about their family in that binder. And, um, and you can look at that right after church. You can go over there right now and look at that, all right? Uh, tonight, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper uh, as a church body, so we invite you back at 6 o'clock tonight for that. Uh, and then um, don't forget your Wednesday night mission team, whichever team you're involved in, uh, be there for that on Wednesday night. And then um, uh, one last announcement. Thank you to those that helped for the fundraiser uh, yesterday. Uh, for the the um, yard sale actually it was like a blacktop sale and uh, but anyways uh, a lot of people came and helped even people that didn't have teenagers came and helped and uh, put it all together and want to just say thank you to everybody that was a part of that teens raised almost fifteen hundred dollars yesterday uh, and that sounds good yeah and um, but they have another uh, one more big fundraiser left and that is a spaghetti dinner and that will take place next Sunday night. And uh, so don't eat Italian all week and then come Sunday for the best Italian <clears throat> on this between 125 and uh, <laughs> in the town of a million. All right. And uh, they have the menu back there. They'll tell you what all it comes with. Uh, they'll give you the prices. I, th I think it's like $7 for an adult meal, $5 for a kid's meal. And it tells you what all, they, uh, what all comes with that. Uh, but you can order that uh, today, right after church. Make sure you go by the table and, and order that. There's also going to be, uh, there's also, we're also going to have with that a dessert auction. All right. Has anybody ever been part of a dessert auction before? Raise your hand. All right. So let me tell you what a dessert auction is. Sorry, y'all. Hopefully you've got weak knees behind me. A dessert auction, we, we found the best people. Well, I'm, there's other people, I'm sure. But we found the best ones that we could find, and we asked them to make a dessert. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm telling you, these are going to be good desserts. I'm talking about peanut butter pie. Anybody like peanut butter pie? All right. We're talking about a peanut butter chocolate cake. We're talking about strawberry shortcake. We're talking about, we're talking about cheesecake. All right. There's like six or seven desserts. Like, how many have ever had Cheryl's cupcakes? Would you raise your hand? How many love Cheryl's cupcakes? Would you raise your other hand? <laughs> I don't want the blood to go in one hand. Um, she, she's, I think, yes, all right. We just lassoed her in. Uh, she's making some cupcakes. Uh, all of these desserts are going to be auctioned off right after the spaghetti dinner. So you have a couple of options. You can bring a lot of money and buy a, one of these desserts. Now, I'm not talking about a slice. I mean, you get the whole thing, right? Or you can make sure you sit at, some, at the table with some people that you think has money. Uh, and you can go talk to them and say, hey, why don't we put all of our monies together and make sure that we win this particular dessert, and then we're going to just share it while we're sitting there. And so you got options. You can, you can hoard it all yourself, or you can show some brotherly love and borrow somebody else's money and bid, right? That's what Acts chapter 4 teaches, that they like gave till everybody had all things in common. And I'm just kidding, that's not, that was way out of context. But anyways, uh, there's going to be a dessert auction uh, next Sunday night, right after the spaghetti dinner. 
There's going to be a raffle, so like there's, we had some companies, including the Cheesecake Factory, send in some gift cards that we'll be raffling those off. And all of those proceeds will help our kids get to camp. And we appreciate everybody's participation in that. And uh, I, I believe that's the last big fundraiser they're doing. They're doing a car wash later uh, sometime when it gets warmer out. And, uh, but anyways, thank you for, for all your participation. We had a wonderful time with the Pine Car Derby. I know the kids did too. All right. So remember, back at the table, they'll be back there. The Ennises, if you want to go across the way and look at their information across the hall, do that. Uh, we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.